Hello, um, welcome to this last video on machine learning. Um, so today we'll, we'll see um, something that's, uh, that's not necessarily new. Um, it was developed in, uh, in the late 80s, um, but it has seen quite some attention in, uh, in recent years, in particular because it allows for neural networks to operate uh, much more efficiently um, and uh, um, because the advances in computing make um, the application of this technique of convolutional neural networks um, possible. So um, first, before we get started in this um, notebook, we'll use um, some advanced features of machine learning. And so one of the things that will be necessary is to work in a runtime that has um, hardware acceleration enabled. So you'll want to make sure that um, this graphical processing unit um, hardware accelerator is enabled. Previously, we've worked with none here, but now make sure that GPU um, is enabled here, because otherwise um, you'll wait about a hundred times longer um, for things to, uh, to to finish in this uh, notebook. Okay, so now that we have that, we can get started. Um, so as a reminder, what we did last time um, is we introduced these artificial neural networks with neurons and activation functions, and in particular, the nonlinearity of these activation functions allowed us to um, obtain better results. And uh, um, we saw that in particular for this MNIST um, handwriting, um, handwritten digit recognition task, um, but we also applied it to our diabetes score um, example. So we'll continue working on this and see how um, our handwriting recognition can be improved by using convolutional neural networks. So let's start by just loading the usual um, packages here. So we'll install Graphviz as well. Um, okay, there it goes. Um, so it'll probably try to reinstall it. Um, so there you see it's installing it. Um, so let's give it a couple of seconds before it finishes. Um, and then the next thing we'll do is just um, go through the exercise we did last time, um, which is just uh, using a, sim a simple neural network to, uh, to analyze um, this MNIST data set. So we'll download the MNIST data set to our, uh, um, to our GPU enabled um, client on, uh, on Google Colab now. So this will download that file. There we go. Um, and then we'll do the usual. We'll split this in a um, training and a test data set. So the first 60,000 entries are going to be for training. The last 10,000 are going to be for um, testing. And of course, we'll permutate or shuffle our data um, to make sure that we don't have any, um, any ordering issues in the data that uh, then replicate into the tra training and test data set. So, so we'll load our uh, multi-layer perceptron. We'll use our stochastic gradient descent. We'll have a hidden layer size of 100 nodes and we'll use ReLU um, activation, which is what we did last time. And we'll just fit our training data, our training inputs and our uh, training targets. And as you can see, the loss function is going down. We'll probably need about, um, I think last time we needed about 20 iterations. So uh, we'll let this um, spin quietly here while it's reaching those 20 iterations. That's of course where the loss curve levels off. Okay, 15, almost there. Okay, there we are, 22 iterations. We've reached a loss at 0 0.035. Um, and of course we can now look at our scores for the training data, which of course is not really the score that we're interested in because that's the, the score um, that is supposed to be close to 100%. But for our test data, we got to 97.8% accuracy. Uh, and the question is now, can we do better than this 97.8? So let's evaluate what it is that uh, may have resulted in this, in this lack of uh, recognition for these additional 2.2% uh, of, uh, of the test data. 
One thing that immediately jumps out is that our algorithm doesn't understand shifts or scaling in the original image. So if we have a seven that's drawn a little bit more to the left or to the right of another seven, then the artificial neural network will treat that as an entirely different set of inputs. Essentially what it does is it treats each pixel individually and if something is shifted, it, it will not look any different to the neural network. So is there a way that we can build in some position and scale invariance, or in other words, in other words, in some sense, train the neural network or build a neural network that knows about shifts in position uh, of the thing that we're trying to identify. And of course, this will be important in particular when we're looking at, uh, at, at examples like detecting cars in, uh, in image footage from self-driving cars those are not always going to be at the same place in the field of view of the camera. So finding something that can detect cars no matter where they are in the image is going to be important. So to be able to solve this, we'll look back at, or, uh, at uh, the uh, chapter where we talked about digital signal processing. What we did there is we introduced this convolution integral. So the convolution of a function f with a function g, and in this case it's a function dependent on the time, is our integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function shifted by tau multiplied by the second function um, at the time tau and then integrated over tau. So this is our convolution integral. So what this did in the time domain was, for example, introduce a noise or, or a response function to or signal f. So g could be the response function, f was the signal, and f convoluted with g is the response after um, or filter g or, or noise component g. So now we'll do this in the image domain, which is essentially the same thing, except it becomes two-dimensional, and our time is not our time anymore, or tau is not a time, but tau will be an x and a y dimension in pixels in our original image. So we talked about that a little bit in digital signal processing when we talked about point spread functions. So point spread functions are the response that our camera sees when it looks at a perfect point in the sky, for example. It's often used in astronomy and in astrophotography. So a perfect point will not show up as a perfect point on the camera. It will be spread out into a little uh, typically um, blurry Gaussian type smear on the camera. And that is the point spread function. It's a Gaussian blur of the original point. So what we'll do is we'll think about similar kind of filter filters, which aren't going to be blur filters, but which we apply to our original image. So let's look at an example here. We have an, an input image map that is this five by five image. Of course, in the case of our MNIST database, this will be a 28 by 28 image, but let's, for the sake of argument, use a five by five black and white image. So it's zero or one. It's not an, a floating point value between zero and one. It's not an integer between zero and 255, but it's a black or white, zero or one. And we want to convolute this with our kernel on the right here. So the kernel has one in the center position and then has ones on the corners but zeros on the sides. So it doesn't necessarily matter what this represents or what this will do to the image, but what we can do is we can take this kernel and convolute our original image with it by taking the kernel, putting it at each position in the image, shifting it along and taking the overlap integral between f and g for that particular position of the kernel in the image. And that's represented here in this animated GIF, which starts now so you can see that the kernel is shifting over the original image and what we do is we just multiply the pixels with each other in the case of our first position so of course it can't go into the first corner because we don't have any padding on our original image which is something we could do but we're not doing in this image so in this first position it starts off it has one 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 and one so it has four so we end up with four in our feature map or our activation map. So from our five by five original image or image map, multiply or convoluted with our three by three feature or kernel, 
uh, or filter, we obtain a three by three activation map. So this is in general the case if we take an n by n input image, we could do padding around the edges of this image so that we could use the, the top uh, left and, and the, the, the top row um, pixels as well. So if we use padding around that, we put zeros around this image. We have p pixels of padding on an n by n input image and an m by m kernel. And we step forward in steps of k. In our case, we step forward in steps one. So our stride was one. Then we obtain an n prime by n prime activation map where n prime is given by this combination here. So n minus m plus two times the padding over our stride plus one. So in our case, we had an original input image that was five by five, so n is five. We had a, a kernel that was three by three, so m is three. We had no padding, p is zero, divided by stride equal to one plus one, so that's three. And indeed, we ended up with a three by three activation map. We could think of this map here as having to be uh, normalized. Um, what we typically will do is we'll make sure that our, our kernels are normalized. For example, here when we have a one, 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 so we have a total of five ones in this kernel, we might divide this all by five. So we have a, a kernel that is normalized. So then our output image map or, or our feature map will also have some of that normalization inherent in it. So we can actually start thinking about plotting or, or drawing this, uh, this feature map. Okay, so what are the possible kernels we could use? Well, one of the, the, the natural kernels, and these are all three by three kernels, one of them that we could use is just the identity kernel. So that's a, a one at the central pixel, zeros at the surrounding pixel. So when we have our original image, which is this, this animal here, um, then we just get the same image back, right? Uh, especially if we add a layer of one pixel of padding on the outside, then we'll get even the outside layer of pixels here correctly. We can introduce convolution kernels that are specific for edge detection. So as you can see here, we negatively count the lower left and upper right pixels, but we positively count the upper left and lower right pixels. So what this will do is it will look for edges in a particular direction, edges along this uh, top left to lower right diagonal. Uh, we can look for, we can introduce other kernels that look for edges. Here it, it's negatively weighting the central pixel, but positively weighting the pixels around it. So this will do edge detection in any direction. Um, and then if we increase that even more, then uh, we have more weight here on our central pixel, even less weight um, or even more negative weight on the outside pixels. So as you can see, this is starting to pick up all of those edges in that original image. Notice that here those kernels are, for example, uh, normalized in a sense. So here we have uh, a sum of elements in our kernel that's equal to zero. Here we have a sum of elements in our kernel that's equal to negative one. Uh, so those are somewhat more normalized than the maximum value of the element would, would lead you to think. We can use these filters to sharpen images or to blur them. So in this case, we count the, or basically what we replace each pixel by is the average of the surrounding um, eight pixels and that pixel itself, so or nine pixels, we take the average and that becomes our box blurred image. We can use Gaussian blur where we weight more heavily the pixels that are to the left, to the right, to the top or to the bottom, but not the ones that are in the corners. So that gives us our uh, a different blur, a different um, kernel. So of course, in convolutional neural networks, what we'll do is we won't tell it what filter to use. We'll just tell it, okay, we want Q filters, Q kernels, different kernels, and we'll let the training algorithm figure out which kernels are going to give our, our best separation between the different classes that we're trying to um, distinguish with our algorithm. We'll also use a nonlinear activation function. So if we go back up to our example here, um, these were all positive values. But you can imagine if we have negative values in our, in our kernel, if we're multiplying with a negative one, for example, for those edge detection kernels, then what we might end up with negative values in our activation map. And when we now apply 
a nonlinear activation kernel, a, a nonlinear activation function to those activation to that activation map, then that will, for example, treat those negative numbers differently from the positive numbers. In particular, what we've used before is this ReLU uh, rectified linear unit activation function. So if we use that on our activation map, then that will give us zeros where we have negative numbers and it will give us just a positive number when we have a positive number. So that introduces this nonlinear activation which was so helpful in the case of regular artificial neural networks. So the same thing will be true in the convolution layer. And then the last thing we want to do is we'll use pooling. So this is really what introduces our invariance under shifts. So let's imagine we have a activation map that is n prime by n prime. What we'll do now is we'll downsample this map by taking, for example, the sum or the maximum in a range of pixels. For example, let's say we have our 28 by 28 input image and we apply a 3 by 3 kernel to that without any padding. Then we'll get a um, 25 by 25 um, activation map. So what we'll do now is we'll downsample this in 5 by 5 blocks so we'll end up with a 5x5 five five activation map after downsampling and so any feature anywhere in this 5x5 five five area that is activated by a particular kernel will um, will have the same output pixel in our 25 um, output um, cells. So, uh, so that has introduced this invariance under shifts um, of up to 5 pixels. So if we put this all together as an image, um, so we start off with an image. This isn't a handwritten digit here, but what we do is we take our convolution that gets turned into one activation here in our convolution layer. So in this case, we have three different kernels, three different filters that we apply. So we get three different filtered n prime by n prime activation maps. And in our pooling, we take a range of pixels in our activation map turn it into a single pixel in our pooled, in our three pooled uh, activation maps. Then we can apply another convolution layer, another pooling layer, and then we can go on to a linearized set of pixels, which is essentially then repeating what we did uh, in a sim simple uh, artificial neural network. So what we do here then is we take these individual pixels and then with fully connected layers, get to the output classification where we then have our predictions of what it is that we're seeing. So in this case, it's recognition of dog, cats, boats, and birds. Okay, so that's the theory of what we're trying to do with convolutional neural networks. Um, and we'll apply that in the next video um, on this, this Keras tool, which is really one of the m professional machine learning tools. So people typically don't tend to use the scikit-learn tools for for heavy duty machine learning applications in particular not for images um, but instead people are using keras um, and the underlying layer and the underlying frameworks that it uses in particular tensorflow so that is what we'll what we'll use um, in the next video